we're used to thinking about induction in terms of the EMF is what you get. EMF being sort of the voltage around the loop. You divide the EMF by the current of the loop and it tells you how much current. We think of it as kind of what the push or what it takes to get the current going around the loop. But what we want to do is get from the EMF to the actual electric field now that we know there's an electric field being formed. So the way to do it is to go ahead and think about it with the loop there. And I won't draw the magnetic field, but just know that there is a magnetic field changing inside the loop. And we think about the work done on a charge, say Q0, as it goes around the loop. And it's going to go all the way around. So what is that work? Well, if we think in terms of the EMF, it's just Q0 times the EMF. Because I told you the EMF is in volts. It kind of represents the push it takes to get something around. So you know, if you multiply uh, a charge times a voltage difference, that, that's the, the change in energy. So the work you would have to do to get that thing around is the equivalent of Q0 times the EMF. If we think about pushing um, against the electric field, <coughs> then the work would be the integral of F dot dS as we walk along, or we could say it's equal to Q0 times the integral of E dot dS, right? Because the force is QE. So that's how much work the electric field would do on a charge as it pushes it around the loop. So we can look at this and say, well, uh, around a loop, if we're on a loop at some fixed radius, say it's thin, so we're just dealing with a, sort of a fixed radius around the loop, that would be uh, E, uh, Q naught, Q naught E times the circumference is 2 pi r. So then we could equate these. We could say, well, this Q times the EMF equals Q times E times 2 pi r. So you could say then that uh, EMF equals E 2 pi r. But we were trying to find E, right? So then we could say that E, the electric field E, equals the EMF over 2 pi r. But the EMF depends on the magnetic field. So now we can use Faraday's law and say that the E, the E field, and we're just doing magnitudes here. We're not worrying about all the, the directions. The magnitude is the EMF is equal to what? Let's see, 2 pi r on the bottom. The EMF is minus d dt of the B field times the area. Well, the B field is changing in time. That's how we set it up. The area is constant. It's just pi r squared. So B times pi r squared. All right. So the pi r squared is constant. It can come out of that derivative. It's really just dB dt. And then, let's say you can cancel uh, that r squared over that r becomes just r. The pi's go away. What you end up with is the magnitude of the E field equals uh, minus r over 2 times dB dt. So if you've got your E field, if you've got a fairly thin ring, constant radius, B field changing inside, that's how you can get the E field. In that case, it's a very simple symmetric case. You can calculate the actual magnitude, the real electric field, and it's real. There's a real electric field swirling around that volume of space, or, or that, that ring. And if you take the ring away, there's still that E field there. And you can see how it changes as you change the radius. It also means that's that specific case. We can also rewrite Faraday's law in a more general way. So we usually would write the EMF as minus d phi b dt. But now if we want to write it in terms of fields, we would say, oh, well, the EMF is the integral of E dot ds. Where if these works are equal, then you just cancel the q naughts, And it's around a loop, the integral of E dot ds around the loop. So here I should put around the loop, because we were thinking about going around a loop there. So the integral E dot ds around a loop equals minus d dt, and we've done this one already, of b dot da. And then we have a more general way to write Faraday's law and a way to think about it. 
it's not that a changing magnetic flux always pushes current through a loop or always just pushes charge, it's that it actually creates an electric field.